I'm glad you're here today. It's a three-day weekend. You could be anywhere. You could be anywhere. But uh, you chose to be here to worship uh, a great God. And I just love, I love the way our, our worship uh, folks, our folks on the stage, led us into our, our, our time of, uh, led us through our time of worship. And uh, just how great is our God. And they led us through those songs in just, just a marvelous way. And the fact that we can be here to worship together, that makes me happy. Uh, and that's what we're talking about this week. We're talking about, I guess, football. We won some football Friday night. Uh, anybody come out victorious last night? Some did? Did I hear a go herd? Yeah, don't hear much of a go herd. <laughs> but we're happy today. We need to be happy today. Uh, and that's what we're talking about in our series. It's a, uh, we're four weeks in. What makes me happy? What makes you happy? And on our very first week, what did we say makes you happy? No thing. Nothing. Happiness is not about a what. Happiness is more about a who or two. It's about relationships. Uh, the next week, second week, we asked the same question. What makes you happy? And we learned sewing. Softer sewing, right? Sewing. We learned it's... Uh, Happiness is something we have to sow our way into. It's not, uh, it's not something that happens immediately. It's not an instant thing. But we sow our way into happiness uh, by, by taking time. And it's a process. If you're an unhappy person, it's not going to be a single song, a single message, or a single church service that's going to make you happy. But it's a process you have to sow into happiness. It takes time. Last week, we talked specifically about sowing our way into happiness in the area of peace. And today, we're going to talk about sowing our way into happiness in the area of money. Now, I know if I didn't have your attention before now, that last word did it. All we have to do is say money, and I get your attention. It's important to you, and it's important to me. It's important to me. Inflation is... Because I have to pay $15 for the $10 haircut I used to get for five when I had hair. And that's not right. It's not right. Money matters. It matters to every single one of us. And you have to sow in that direction of, of uh, money. Uh, and, and it's important in money because we think, or we thought we knew what would make us happy. In the area of money and in other areas as well. Isn't that true? I thought that job would make me happy. Or I thought he would make me happy. Or I thought that raise would make me happy. Or this car would make me happy. Uh, and so here's the first takeaway from today. The first takeaway is this. You should not believe everything you think. Okay? Don't believe everything you think. Because you have absolutely made some wrong decisions about what would make you happy because you were doing what you thought would make you happy. Now, you've heard people say, money won't make me happy. You've heard preachers say, money won't make you happy. And you kind of nod your heads and give kind of a visual consent to that. Money won't make you happy, but here's the thing. None of us believe that. You don't believe that. I don't believe that. We hear people say money won't make you happy. Money won't make you happy. And we are thinking, just try me on that one. <laughs> just let me have a shot at it. Is there a test I take to find out if money will make me happy? Let me sign up. I want to take it because the bottom line is I think money will make me happy. I know it involves a who or two, but when you boil it all down and you get to the bottom of it, I think money will lead to happiness. And here's why we think that. There really is a connection between money and happiness. But where we mess up and we get it all wrong is because we think the, the corollary, we think the connection is this word, more. If I had more money, I would be more happy. If I had more money, I, I would be happier. Now let me ask you a question. How much more money would it take 
to make you more happy. Now, if you really believe that more money would make you happy, you should know the answer to this. How much more money would it take to make you happy? Well, I know the answer to that question. For every single purpose, or for every single person here, whether you have a little, or you have more in the middle, or you have a lot, or you have, really, how did you get that much money? I know the answer for every one of us, and the answer to how much more money would it take for you to be happy, you to have peace? The answer is, more than I currently have. More than I currently have. No matter where you are in life, where you drive, or what you drive, but how much you earn, no matter, you know, anything at all, the answer to this question will always be the same for everybody here, more than I currently have. And that's why I'm glad we're here today. I'm here and you're here because we're going to find out there is a corollary between our money and happiness, but it's not the word more. It's not because you know people with more money than you, and some of those are not happy people. You know more uh, people with more money than those people have money, and some of those are not happy people. And you know people with less money than you have, and some of those are happy people. Steve, you were great on that video. Man, you were one of the happiest guys I've seen. Uh, but you know people with less money than you, and some of those are happy people. They love each other. Their home is content. You can tell it through and through. And so there is this connection between happiness and money, but it's not this word more. It's not more. They actually connect around another word, and that word is managed. It's not how much you have, but how you manage what you have that determines whether you're happy when it comes to your money. It's not the management, or it's, it's not the, the quantity of, but it's the management of. In other words, money can contribute to your happiness if you manage it well. Now, follow me here, because anything that undermines your peace, anything that under cuts or erodes your peace of mind will undercut your happiness. Which means if you mismanage your money, you're going to miss or you're going to miss out on peace. It just that's the way it is. It doesn't make any difference how much you have or how much you earn. And Jesus says you have to get in control of your finances because if you don't learn to manage your finances well, and that's where many Americans are, and statistically, that's where some of us are. If you don't learn to manage your money correctly, your money will manage you. And if your money manages you or your finances are managing you, you do not have peace. And Jesus has just a wonderful teaching on this, and it's compact into one verse of Scripture. It's found in the Gospel of Luke, the 16th chapter. It's in verse 13, and it's a powerful piece of Scripture. Listen to what he says. We're going to read the first part of that, and then come back and visit it again. Luke 16, verse 13, we have this recorded. No one can serve two masters, either he will, or you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And we're going to take a break right there. If you have your, your Bibles open, you know that verse goes on. But let's take a break right there because we see this can't serve two masters. And we say, well, that's okay with me. I don't have a master anyway. I don't live in the first century. I am my own master. I do what I want, when I want, with whoever I want. Uh, and, and then Jesus goes on to talk about these two masters, and we begin to see where he's going with it. Uh, well, in the application, he says we can only serve one master, and then he talks about the two. He says you can't serve God and money. Now, he's been saying you have to, or you will love one and hate the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. These are opposites. So you would think he would do the same thing here. What is the opposite of God? Wouldn't that be evil? The opposite of God, maybe that would be Satan, or that would be sin. You can't serve both God and Satan, but that's not what he said. He said you cannot serve God and money. Now, that's not, it's not a perfect translation, but it's close. Uh, some of the older translations, King James, King James, for example, says God and mammon. But what's a mammon? We don't know what that is. So money is kind of a close translation, 
But a broader, more accurate translation really is you can't serve God and all of your stuff. It includes money, but it's broader than that. It's the stuff you have, the stuff you want, the stuff uh, that you don't have the money for yet to buy the stuff you want. It's just all of your stuff. Jesus says you cannot serve both God and uh, your stuff. You can only serve one. And God wants your devotion. God wants your heart. And Jesus is saying there is a competitor, and the chief competitor for your allegiance is your stuff. It's your stuff. And you think, I get that, I, I, I kind of know that, but, but hey, I don't serve my stuff. I, I don't love money. But let's read on just a little bit, because Jesus is giving us another, another way to look at that. It's, it's not just you love your money. He says you might be uh, devoted to one, and, and, uh, uh, and despise the other. No man can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other. He says, or you will be devoted to. That's what it means to love stuff, to be devoted to. And we know what that means. Devoted to means there's a strong attachment to. Or I've, I, I've got my eye on that. Or there's a quest for or it becomes the primary filter through which I look when I begin to make a, a financial decision is what I'm most devoted to. And Jesus says, hey, you may not like the word love, you may not know exactly what I mean by that, but you know what I mean when I say devoted to, and let's be honest, we're pretty devoted to our stuff and our acquisition of stuff. So let me ask you another kind of pesky question. Has your desire for something ever caused you to do something? Let me add a word to that. Has your desire for something ever caused you to do something dumb? Can you say timeshare? <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Got it. Huh? Can you say timeshare? We, do, we make big mistakes. Big mistakes. Something dumb. But we make small mistakes, we make small decisions, poor decisions, all the time in small ways. Every day on the way to work, you go by that expensive coffee shop. I think it's called the Cafe O Layaway. And you've just got to have that breakfast blend. So you add up, drive up to the window and get your $12 cup of Ethiopian coffee. But you say, I want to place an order here, I want a Kachingasino. How about that? Or give me, give me one of those Costa lattes. Uh, we make decisions all the time that we kind of think back on it. Was that, was that necessary? Did I, did I get carried away with that? So the question is, has your uh, desire for something ever caused you to do something? Something dumb. And for all of us, the answer is yes. You have. I, I know you have. We've all done it. We've made impulse buys. We've bought things we didn't need. Some of us still owe for things that we don't even have anymore. So and we look back on it and say, that was so dumb. So let me ask you that in another way. Have you ever done something, ever have a desire for something that caused you to do something you regret? And again, the answer I know is yes. You see, our devotion, your devotion to your desire to spend, to satisfy a need that's never ever met, that need for more, and in those moments, that decision, your finances, mastered you. Now, Jesus is smarter than a lot of people give him credit for, and he says your chief competitor, God's chief competitor for your desire, or, and for your heart and your devotion, is your desire for stuff. And it has the power to enslave us. And you know where it begins. It begins with the word discontentment. And that's a powerful thing. Discontentment ensures that I am never satisfied because I know what you have. And I know what there is to have. You see, the fuel for discontentment is the word awareness. As soon as we become aware of what somebody else has, we're discontent. As soon as we know what there is to have, we're discontent. And, and the thing that drives discontentment is this word awareness. As you become aware that there's a new model out there, we become discontent. I can't tell you the number of times that I've 
been in a store just browsing. I've got no business in that store. I don't need anything in that store. But I'm in there browsing. Now, you probably have never done that. For me, it's a, it's a home improvement store or a hardware store, and you're just walking along looking at the shelves of the inventory, and you see something that you didn't even know this thing existed. You've never, you've never seen it before, but you thought, look at that. And suddenly, not only did you know it existed, but suddenly you needed it. You needed it. And in about 30 seconds, you go from, I didn't know it existed, to I need it. And then you check out with it. <laughs> Discontentment is a powerful thing. And what drives it, partly, is this word awareness. But there's another fuel, another driver for, for discontent, and that's greed. We'll never see that in the mirror but what it looks like, Jesus says, just imagine it's the person who has the assumption that it's all for my consumption. Greed is if it gets placed in my hands, it is for me. Now, I might give you a little bit of it. I might share a little bit with this worthy cause or this worthy cause. But basically, if it's in my hands, it is for me. And if you live with the assumption that everything is for your consumption, welcome to church, by Jesus' definition, you're a greedy person. And here's the thing, if everything that comes into your hands, and listen to me here, if everything that comes into your hands is for you, you're going to use it on you and for you. But here's the problem, again, that's, that's greed doing this, and the desire for stuff is an appetite, that will never, ever, finally, and fully be satisfied. So if you're driven by discontentment, aware, 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 and you live with this idea that everything that comes your way is for your consumption, you're going to spend everything you have on you, but you're not going to stop there. Because you are an American. And in America, we don't stop when the money's gone. That is so last century. And that brings us to our third happy word, debt. Our third happy word. And listen to this. I found this, I found this phrase, and I love it. It's not original with me. I'm not this bright. But here's the phrase, and it's powerful. I want is better than I owe. Would you say that with me? I want is better than than I owe. And that's a big idea. When you want something and don't have it, there's tension. But when you owe for something and you can't pay or you don't want to pay, there's tension. And we've all lived long enough to know which is the better tension, which one we would rather live with. I want is always better than I owe and can't pay for it or wish I'd never bought it in the first place. And you're going to be in one camp or the other because you, like me, were always going to want stuff. Now, debt is when you become a slave. You become a slave to your desire, and it has the power to enslave you. And when that happens, if that happens, you're not a happy person. Because you're owing for things you wish you'd never purchased in the first place, and now you can't make your payment, or you don't want to make your payment. And here's the other problem with debt. The I want... The I want is between you and God. God, I really want this. And you fill in the blank. Whatever that blank is. God, I really want this. And maybe you hear God's Spirit speaking to your spirit. And He is saying, not now. This isn't the right time. You can't afford it. You need to save more. It's a dumb decision. Don't do it. You see, when you're with this want, I want, that's between you and God. But once you borrow to purchase... It's not between you and God anymore. It's between you and a creditor. And here's the worst part. God sides with the creditor. Psalm 37th chapter. It's not going to be on the screen, but the 21st verse says this. The wicked borrow and do not repay. But the righteous gives generously. You see, if you're a Christ follower, you pay what you owe. If you're a Christ follower, you pay your debts. You see, if, if, you, if you want, if it's I want, I want, I want, that's between you and God. But just as soon as you borrow to buy, it's now between you and the creditor, and God stands behind the creditor saying, I'm on her side. 
or I'm on his side. And you say, but wait a minute, God, you switched sides on me here. And God says, no, I didn't. I tried to tell you. You shouldn't have done it. I warned you. So I want is always better than I owe. And in, over 25 years ago, Joy and I decided for our house, for our house, we would stay out of debt. And here's why. Because I didn't want my family, and she didn't want our family, and I don't want you or your family to trade your peace for something that will never bring you peace. Now let's, let's, review. let's review these three words. We've got discontentment, we've got greed, and debt. Now look at those words and you tell me, which one of those makes you happy? <laughs> which one? Which one makes you happy? Oh, it's that discontentment, isn't it? You go to your mailbox around Christmas time and you get all these sale papers and all these catalogs and you bring them into your house and look at all this stuff that you don't have and you say, oh, my life is so fulfilled. No. Debt doesn't make you happy. Uh, discontentment doesn't make you happy. Uh, what, what about greed? Would greed make you happy? I just consume, consume, consume. It's all for me. I'm going to spend right up to the limit and beyond. It's all for No. Greed doesn't make you happy. Debt, the more I owe, the happier I am. You open up all that mail every day and you look at all these bills that you owe now and you think, Jesus, I love my life. This is great. No. None of these words bring happiness. So here's the application, okay? Are you ready? Here's the application. Stop it. <laughs> Just stop it. Don't do this anymore. If you want to connect your happiness to your money, do away with these three things, and you're going to be a whole lot happier. How much money, after all, would it take to eliminate discontentment? Greed. No amount of money, no amount of money is going to address these things. What addresses these things is management. It's how you manage your money. It's not how much you have, it's who's in control. Who's the boss? And that's what Jesus is saying in this chapter, in Luke, the 16th chapter, the 13th verse. He says, no one, no one, no one can serve two masters. And so he gives us an alternative. He says, no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and and money, which means there is a way, and some of you have been a Christian even longer than I have, and you know there is a way to submit your financial world to God, you submit your financial life to Him, and you say, God, I don't want my stuff to manage me. I want you to manage me, and I want you to lead me and teach me how to manage my stuff. And Jesus suggests you don't have to be a slave to money. You can have a new master. He's saying you can have a new master and his name is not card. I'm not moving on until that's properly appreciated. Uh, uh. All right, all right, are you with me? I know this is kind of a touchy topic, and, and sometimes we get a little uneasy with it, but this is, this is Bible, and you want to know what makes you happy. You've got to sow in the direction of happy. So you take everything that Jesus taught about money, and everything that the Old Testament teaches about money, and you can kind of condense all of that down. That's a lot of word, but you can condense it to two. Basically two words, generosity and wisdom. And you find the happiest people that you know, and you talk to them about their money, and I think you'll find these two things are paramount. They're a generous people, and they're wise when it comes to their money. They're wise. So when you contrast generosity and wisdom with discontent and greed and debt, is there any competition at all? No. No, if you, want to, if you want the connection, the, the, the physical, simple, practical application of how to go with your money to the place of happy, this is how you do it. And we show you uh, this slide every Sunday around our offering time. And it's a very simple phrase that talks about giving first, giving first, 
saving second, and living on the rest. We see that every Sunday. And it's a great reminder of God's simple plan for managing our money. Now, I love those three words, give, save, live. Every time you get money, you say to that money, you're not my master. And I'm going to show you you're not my master because I'm going to give some of you away. Boom. Done. Gone. You give first. You give to God's kingdom. You take care of his kingdom first. And then you save for your kingdom second. You, and then you live on the rest. You give it as soon as it comes your way. You don't have to wait for a special commercial. You don't have to wait for some kind of a, a strong tug on your heart. You just know God has given it to you. You owe that first portion to him and you give it. Giving, I love this, giving always, always, always results in joy. Discontentment, no joy. Greed, no joy. Debt, no joy. Saving, listen to this, saving. Money in the bank always brings peace in the mind. Brings peace in the mind. What a concept. What a concept. Save. Saving results in peace. Debt doesn't result in peace. Discontentment, greed, those things don't result in peace. And then that final peace, live on the rest. Choose to live on the rest. And you are financially free. You simply choose not to spend more than you make. Wish you'd thought of that a long time ago, right? Wow, wish our young people, 20s, 30s, would, would get that concept. Don't spend more than you make. That's what the Bible teaches. And if you live on what's left, you're financially free. It would be great if you could drive around in your car saying, I could buy one of those, but I'm not going to. I could have one of those. Yeah, but I'm not going to. I could live over there, but I'm not going to. I could, I could, I could, but I'm not going to because I would rather have peace. I would rather have freedom and joy than a new house, a new car, a new phone, a new boat, a new anything. And I want you to experience that joy and peace and freedom in Jesus is inviting you into this. And more money won't bring you into it. The way you manage your money will. And this is how you make your money make you happy. So here's the thing. You know what makes you happy financially? Sowing in the direction of giving, saving, and living on the rest. Because you're smart enough to know that discontentment, greed, and debt will never make you happy. So stop. Sow for happiness. Sow in that direction. So the beginning, your very next piece of income, paycheck, social security check, whatever it is, whatever, district, what, what, whatever it is, when that first comes to you, you look at it and say, you are not my master. God is my master. I am your master, and I'm going to manage you properly. It's not the amount, after all. It's not the amount of the money. It's the way you manage it that makes all the difference. And your best option is to invite Jesus, to invite your Heavenly Father to manage you and to show you how to manage your money properly. Would you begin today by asking Him to become your Heavenly Father? Would you consider beginning uh, obeying in part in the area of your finances? You'll never regret it. Joy, freedom, peace, financially. Will you pray with me, please? God, thank you for these moments that we've been able to share. Lord, what an awesome God you are. Help us to trust you in all things. All things are yours. Uh, all resources are yours. We can't imagine how great they are, but Lord, neither can we imagine how great is your love for us. Thank you for that. And Lord, just now we pray that we'll respond to your love. If there's a need here that could be met by, by stepping out publicly, by confessing your name, by being baptized in the name of, of uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord, whatever the needs might be possible today, we pray that you will meet them, that we'll allow you to meet them. And as we respond to your call and your invitation, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. This morning we do have a, a time of response. And if you're a follower of Christ, but not really where you want to be, 
we invite you to whatever step that would be, whether it's to confess his name, to be immersed into Christ. Uh, if you want to step out and say, I want this to be the place that I call home. I want this to be my church. I want to give here. I want to contribute here. I want to be uh, people to feed into me here. Then you come and, and, and make, that, make that known today as well. Maybe you want prayer. You can pray here uh, privately if that's what you choose. I'll be over here to the left. And you can come and, and, and I'll pray for you if, if you would choose that as well. But if you can respond, need to respond to the invitation of Christ. Will you do that? Will you stand with me? And will you respond as, as, we, as we sing?